Now, do you remember with My Rhyme Ain't Done, to me, one of the more imaginative early songs in rap? Uh, the creative or the feedback or the interaction you guys got once you started hearing the lyrics on that one? I thought it was, I thought it was, what's the right word for it? I thought it was, uh, I won't say comical. I'll say it was, um, okay, yeah, the simple word. It was different because I've heard nursery rhymes before. We've all heard nursery rhymes, but not like that. <laughs> now, I've heard other stuff in L.A. like Dolomite on the X-rated, you know, R-rated side, but I haven't heard it to where kids can listen to it. You know what I'm saying? So that was, you know, that that's a, I don't know, you have to really snake your way through that to make that, because it was really hard to not go left with that. You know, it's so, nursery rhymes are so goody-goody to goody goody and to keep it funny and interesting and new at the same time, how many people can do that, you know? I don't even be, think the people that wrote the original nursery rhymes could actually change it and make it any better. LL, to me, made them better. I mean, come on. With Cinderella, not Cinderella, what was her name? Um, uh, the Rabbit and the, what's her name? Oh, Alice in Wonderland? Yeah, Alice in Wonderland. That's just Alice in Wonderland. That's what was in his hand. That's what that, 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 come on, man. That's that's crazy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That was a phenomenal song. One of my favorites on there. Um, now, with that, how did um, you guys put that out? And it's hugely successful. So, did you work on? Tougher Than Leather with Beach to Rhyme before Bigger and Deffer was released or after? Um, everything that had to do with Bigger and Deffer was Bigger and Deffer. Everything, because after that, we left in the tour. When we came back from the tour, that's when I made Beach to the Rhyme. That that came about, Jam Master J was out of town. Joey wanted to go to the studio. He didn't want to wait on Jay. Davey wasn't available, Davey DMX. And I just so happened to be at the right place at the right time. I was up at Def Jam, up at Rush, um, and said, yo, I need to go to the studio. Buff, come to the studio with me. Make a beat for me. I'm like, OK. And I always kept my drum machine in the trunk of my car. We went there and we knocked that puppy out. <laughs> Beast to the rhyme and the rhyme I just made. So the question was, have yeah. you seen Davey? And they said, no, we haven't. Yeah, uh, okay, Davey came the following day and put the samples on top of it. Okay. But so, yeah, so so it was myself, Davey, uh, and Run, we and Steve Vett. We were the only ones in the studio that day. Yeah. So but, then, Joe, but, uh, but Russell, I mean, um, but uh, Jam Master was out of town. Okay. And, and, then, Darryl, and DMC, he was there too. So then this ties into LL and Run DMC because at the time, those two were, if not the biggest, two of the absolute biggest artists in rap. And you're going in there as a, essentially prior to Bigger and Deffer, of course, relatively, if not totally unknown to them as an unknown entity. Mm -hmm. So what, right. how, how did they, and how and why do you think they embraced you? And then what was it like for you, did you when you were stepping back, like, whoa, you know, I just produced LL and I just produced Run MC and I wrote a song, and, you know? Okay, that goes back to Uncle Jam's Army. We were the first, Uncle Jam's the first uh, entity to bring East Coast rap to the West Coast. And the first groups that we brought were Run DMC. And then another time we brought Run DMC back, they brought LL. LL was 16 years old, and all he had was one record, I Need a Beat. That's all he had. So we brought them. So I had known them from Uncle Jam's Army. But So when we got to New York, they were like, hey, what are you guys doing here, you know? And uh, they, they knew the story. They found out the story of how we got there. And 
man, it's, it was a whirlwind after that. But as far as me really saying, hey, I, I, I produced this and I produced that, it didn't hit me then. It was just, I was just there to make records for whoever wanted, wanted to make. And um, it didn't matter if it was LL or Run DMC or Houdini or anything like that. It was just a matter of going in and doing the best that I could, you know, lay the best thing I could lay out there for whoever artist. I didn't want to go completely left, going there and making some R&B stuff for Run DMC. It's not going to happen. But I came in with my best beat making face on and made tracks after track until somebody said, hey, I like that. Okay, that's the one we're going with. You know what I'm saying? But back then, I would just make track. Whatever was in my head, I just had to get to a studio and just tilt my head over and pour it out. I had so many tracks in my head. You know, back then, sampling was the thing. Uh, I, I liked the sample, but I didn't like the sample like Puffy would sample. He would take a whole doggone song and loop that shit. I would like to take elements of the song. And sample. I would take a guitar riff here and a, a kick drum there and you know, just just different pieces and make my own. But you know, I wasn't really the loop sampler. I eh, that those songs are already hits. Right. I'm trying to make my own hit, you know what I'm saying? So it was uh it was it wasn't really a matter of of me saying, Wow, I'm about to go in with somebody, I'm going to work. And whoever, scripture says, whoever you work for, do your best, you know? So I, whoever I worked for, I just did my best. I did whatever I could do. Right. So then, of course, you also did stuff with The Real Roxanne. And that, uh, so how, how did that connection happen? Okay. <laughs> okay, Daryl, I'm about to put Daryl on back. Daryl used to love, we met Joanne. Real Roxanne in L.A., Uncle Jam's Army again, at a show that we did at the Olympic Auditorium with the Real Roxanne, UTFO, and the Boogie Boys. And uh, that's how we met Joanne. So when we got, Daryl always said, ooh, I want to meet her. One day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet this girl, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to hook up with her. We was in New York. We finally met her. I can't remember where we met her or how it came about, but uh, Daryl invited her over to our apartment. She came by and we, they talked a while. And we know, you know, let's go in the studio. Let's cut some records. Let's see what's going on. He met her. He was in love with that girl. But so was Jam Master Jay. They both liked Joanne. But there wasn't no beef between them or nothing like that. But that's how we ended up working with her with Jay. Because Jay was actually part of the production, you know. Yeah, it says Jim and L.A. Posse. And L.A. Posse, yeah, it was just us. And so we got together because Jay, Jay was my best friend. Him and Jaleel Hutchins from Houdini. Those were my best friends in New York. Wow. And uh, Jay was like, yeah, man, let's, let's, uh, cause, you know, I think Daryl probably told you, Jay's the one that gave us the name L.A. Posse. Yep, he told me. Yeah, so he gave us that. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was just a matter of Daryl really wanted to meet this girl. <laughs> And she wasn't doing anything. She had all her singles, you know. And we told her, why don't we just go in and just cut some records and see what happens? Now, mind you, Joanne had never had an album. So when we went up and talked with Fred Maneo, who was the head of Select Records, uh, we went and talked to him about, you know, her songs. And, and he liked her songs. He said, what are we going to do? And I said, why don't you put them on an album for her? She's never had an album. They were like, he was, He looked and like, you know what? I never cut an album on her. And so he not only added those songs, he added all of her old Bang Zoom and all that to the album. I said, because those were never on the album either. And so he, that's how she ended up making that album. And that was Select because UTFO was on Select and she had already been... Well, or what? Well, yeah, that's where she was. That's where she, her contract resided. That's where she was. and But she wasn't doing anything. I mean, Fred was not pushing her to make any more records. And we was like, yo, you need to really make some records. You know, you hot, look great. You know, you got all that energy. And so be it. So we actually went in without a budget. 
because Fred wasn't giving us any money. He didn't give Jay any money. He didn't give me any money. And we went in and cut those songs, and we didn't get any money until after wow. we presented those songs to him. I mean, Fred Bonilla was a butthole. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, come on, man. Dude, you, you really, Fred, you really need to rethink your strategy, man, because you could be so much farther ahead of where you were if you would just treat people right. But anyways, that's another hey, story. They had a good uh, roster, UTFO, Real Roxanne, Chubb Rock, Kid and Clay. They had, they had some yeah, he had a great roster, but he didn't know what to do with them. He didn't treat his artists at the stars that they were. They were stars. They had great stuff. But Fred was worried about Fred. He wasn't worried about his artists. Hmm. That's and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so then did, uh, what was the conversation, if, if any, did you ever have with Jam Master Jay about Beast to the Rhyme? Did he ever talk to you about it? Like, oh, man, you know, like what? No. Never. We never talked about it. It was just, it was a song. And he performed it and he loved it. He mixed it. He mixed it down when he came back. Okay. And it was, it was good. I mean, me and Jay had a great rapport. Great. I like when I say great, Jay was my best friend. I can remember, I remember one time, um, we were starving at our apartment and Jay was just getting out of the studio. It was like five in the morning, five, maybe six in the morning. And on his way back to Queens, he stopped by our apartment. He said, well, you guys got to eat. I'm hungry. And as it, as we said, Jay, we ain't got no groceries. We ain't have nothing in the refrigerator but a, a, a head of lettuce and a bottle of water. You know what I'm saying? Or something like that, about a thing of milk or something like that. And Jay said, okay, let's go grocery shopping. Jay took us to Pathmart. Never been to Pathmart before in my life. And we went grocery shopping. And he bought maybe four hundred dollars worth of groceries. Came back just he bought four hundred dollars worth of groceries just so he could have pork chops and eggs and potatoes in the morning. That's what he wanted. He ate that. We made that. Had a, groceries everywhere. All he wanted was his breakfast. He went in there, sat on the couch, and went to sleep. Wow. That was Jay, you know. And well, Jay, here's my fondest memory. One of my fondest memories of Jay. He had a closet full of Sega Genesis video game consoles. He used to play people for their consoles. And Jay was really good at that Madden back then. He was really, really good at it. So he had like 15 consoles. And uh, we were playing, and he played me for my console, and I didn't want to give my console up. <laughs> so he said, no, go ahead. I'll let you keep the, the controls, but you got to put the console in the closet. <laughs> So I had to put my console and I had to walk home with just my controllers in my hand. <laughs> wow. Now what about um, with the real Roxanne, also Howie T was on there, because uh, of course right. he, he was a prominent producer, of course, and did a lot of great work his, himself. But what, did you have any interaction with him or talk to him at all? While None. You know what? To this day, I never met Howie T. Wow. To this day. I didn't know what he looked like except for, you know, I see him on pictures. But if he walked up to me in the street today, I wouldn't know who that was. That's I've never met Howie T. That's crazy. Neither have I. But I've always admired his work. He did a lot of, he did a lot of amazing Yes, he did a lot of work. I respected him, but I never met him. I never met the man. Be sure to check out the History of Gangsta Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangsta Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangsta Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your MTV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.